that we're about to talk about is deeply personal and is incredibly powerful. And we know, O oh Lord, the way that our heart can be so swayed and pulled. There are people in here who are feeling hurt. There are people in here who have done the hurting. There are people in here, Lord, who carry a measure of uh, sorrow and struggle. Some carry shame. Some feel overcome and powerless when it comes to talking about this topic. And so we are going to need your special grace. So help us, Lord, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I realized that I'm not going to need an opening illustration to draw you all in to create some interest when we talk about this topic, because we're talking about sex and sexuality. And everybody's already like, right, I'm listening, but I almost wish I didn't have to, because I don't like talking about this one. I don't like thinking about this one. I don't want to like facing up to this one. But the fact is, we're going there today because Jesus went there, didn't he? In a public place. Because we've been looking at the Sermon on the Mount. Because the King has come and announced that he is renewing all that is broken. He is breaking all that is oppressive. He is bringing newness and forgiveness and a new start to the world. And he has announced it with his miracles and his disciples are following it and they're up on the hill. And he looks at the crowds around him and he looks into the eyes of his disciples and he knows... He knows our struggles, he knows our brokenness, he knows our failures, he knows our pain. And he looks them in the eye and says, I'm going to go there because I've got to go there. And that's so encouraging to people like you and me, isn't it? Because it tells us that he's not bothered about us, an outward religious capitulation and a form that we're supposed to find. He's interested in the inner person, inner transformation. Not outward capitulation, but inner transformation. Do you get that? So when God came in the flesh, he says, I know what you need. And it's more than outward conformity. You need a revolution. You need a salvation. You need a redemption. And I'm the king that can deliver it. And of course, all of that was done against the backdrop of the leaders of the day, the Pharisees, the religious leaders, who were really happy with outward sort of conforming to certain patterns. But Jesus knew that you cannot relate, uh, sorry, religious yourself into relationship with the living God. You need the king to deliver you into relationship with the living God. And then what you need the king to do is renew you from the inside out. So what was the news that we considered last week when it came to the topic of anger? Wow, It was that although you may not have shed blood outwardly and committed murder, it is possible to have a murderous rage inside you that dominates your heart, rules the way you see other people, gives you a sense of being God, and ends up carrying you to hell. And Jesus says, no, I say to you, I'm going to break that. I'm going to break that and make you new. And today he's going in exactly the same way to this place where we almost don't want him to go to, he's going to this area of sexual desire. And there was so much confusion back then as there is so much confusion right now. Sex and relationship. And he looks into the eyes of the crowd and he says, I know your story. I know that there's so much confusion and shame There's so much desire to hide away and not let other people in. And that's right, because these elements of our our life are more personal and intimate. So we don't mess about with them. But there are people carrying hurts. There are people carrying shame. There are people who are carrying pain and sorrow. There are people who are incredibly fearful about whether this thing will overcome them or fearful that I'll never be able to forget. And Jesus wants to bring his grace. We need to let him speak into it. And where does he start? He starts with the shallow eye of the culture of the day. Did you see it there? Verse 27. I say shallow ideas. You've got to see why it's shallow because actually it's awesome, but they were applying it in a shallow way. Verse 27 says this, you have heard that it was said, do not commit adultery. And they had heard that it was said, 
But when they thought of it, they thought merely of the outward thing. Whatever you do, if you're married, don't go carrying on with her down the street. Don't go carrying on with him down the street. Now, in some sense, it's obvious, isn't it? Nobody here who has ever been cheated on thinks that it's a good idea to have people cheat on them. I want to go even further than that and say anybody who has cheated, after a while, they feel the carnage and the pain and the sorrow and the tearing effect and the insecurity that comes and the confusion emotionally, relationally, spiritually, and they're like, this is a bad thing. Keep as far away from unfaithfulness in relationship and in marriage as you possibly can. You see, it's possible when you read a, you shall not commit adultery, to hear that God is a God who, of, the, of the, you're not, you must not. No, but all of his commands come out of his goodness, and behind his you're not is a you shall. What is it that the Lord wants to uphold here? It's this beautiful thing called the covenant of marriage, where two people come together and say, forsaking all others, we will build a relationship of growing intimacy, of growing vulnerability, with the safety locked round, uh, around it that says, I will never leave you nor forsake you. Now, who does that tell you the story of? It tells you the story of the king. So every marriage looks way beyond you. Each one of your marriages looks way beyond you. It tells a story of what the world is really built upon. A wonderful God of grace who wonderfully commits to intimate relationship with his people. So when he is saying, you shall not commit adultery, he is saying, you will enjoy a faithfulness and a closeness and an exclusivity that speaks about me. And that's why sex is there. Sex is, if you like, a covenant renewal exercise which celebrates the coming together. It involves desires, a desire for one another that tells a story in the same way that I am yielding all of myself to you legally, relationally, aspirationally, spiritually, in the act of sexual intimacy, there is a shield down, take me as I am, I know I'm not perfect, but receive me and do it within the safety of this promise that I will not be going anywhere. And the Lord also knows this, doesn't he? That if you express those sexual desires without that padlock around, it doesn't lead to good places. You see, if you offer and use your sexual desire in something that's not locked in, what you find is that effectively it becomes... Well, you're in this situation where you've got a consumer relationship. What I'll do is... I'll offer myself out to you or use you to fulfill my sexual desires as long as it is working for me. But the moment that it is not working for me, I'll walk away. And all I've done there in that moment is use that person for my ends I haven't committed. I'm doing something with my body with that person that I won't do with the rest of my life. And the Lord says, don't even go there. That's a denial of my story. It's a denial of who I am. It's the denial of what true humanity looks like. So marriage is this beautiful covenant that points beyond itself. It's a reflection of him, his covenant faithfulness. So what happens when we keep that sexual relationship in the way that it's supposed to be there and have our sexual desires there in a balanced and right way well, the marriage becomes a zone of security. I'm no longer in that marriage having to fear that I'll be rejected or I'm having to market myself. You know, they did a survey not so long ago on people who cohabit, live together before they get married. Because interestingly, what happens is that you stay married less long if you have lived with somebody first. Doesn't make much sense that, does it? Because you'd have thought, oh, I've tried it on for size and I think it fits, therefore we'll get married and we'll sign. No, it's the opposite way around. People asked why when the survey, they asked why, and they said this, I found that I was on permanent marketing of myself. 
So there's, do you see that? There's a less security there. There's a sense that I've always got to, because I don't know for sure that this person is definitely sticking with me, and that gets carried over into marriage. But when sex is kept within marriage, and, and, wow, a zone of security. You find that there's deeper feelings that get nurtured as well. Because you know in that moment that this person is totally committed to you, so you're safe to be vulnerable. And if there's one thing that deepens feelings in a relationship, it's what? Vulnerability. We sometimes find that in the men's group. You know, there we are, and we, we're sort of going about our business, just talking about the footy, but afterwards we get, we get real and we talk about how we're processing difficult things, and there's this strange thing that happens in the room where the guys don't know how to handle it, do, the, do we? We suddenly feel more connected. And um, we're like, do I hug him? No. Do I tap him? I know. Mock him. Brilliant. And that's just the way we do it. But vulnerability within safety is a beautiful, deep thing. And of course, there's freedom. Imagine being in a relationship where I know I am safe, secure. I've got a ring on it. Therefore, I don't need to view the relationship through the lens of how I'm feeling about it because feelings can be incredibly oppressive. Your feelings can shift depending on how much food you've had to eat, how much sleep that you've had, how you, what time of the month it is, what I, anything. And so often, we're, oh, does he love me? Will he be there for me? Is she going to be faithful? I don't have to worry about that because I've got one of them on my finger. And our sexuality is to be expressed as the ultimate in sort of coming together and saying, I do with my body and my emotions and the giving of myself spiritually what I'm doing with the whole of my life. Do you see what the Lord loves to protect? And Jesus comes along and he looks them all in the eyes and he says, listen, this is the Sermon on the Mount, not the suggestion on the Mount. Definitely. This is the story that you want to tell. This is how we've been made and it is good and it is great. Live under it. You've heard it said that, but... Do you know, have you spotted the problem? There would have been religious leaders in that crowd, and they'd have listened to all of that and go, well, fine. In fact, tick, I haven't gone out of my... I haven't committed adultery. I'm righteous. I'm in with God because I haven't done a dastardly deed. I wonder whether there's any Pharisees sitting here. You've just put your halo on your horns. And you've gone, well, I'm better than the people who have failed here. No, you're not. And Jesus wanted to realize that our problem goes deeper than just what we do outwardly. It's an inward thing. And so he says in the next verse, verse 28, can you see it there? But I tell you that anyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery with her in his heart. The Pharisees are applauding and suddenly they go quiet. What? I thought lustful looks were just a normal part of life. It's just become normal for me to check people out. It's just become normal for me to, when I'm feeling tired and worn out, let my romantic desires drift in a certain way. It's just become normal that I'm just like scrolling and just checking and giving an opinion and daring to think. Yet we know that it is wrong not to look at a woman because they're beautiful, not to look at a fella but to look at a woman or another person lustfully. That word lust there is very close to greed and covetousness. Do you see that? It's that moment, you see, that you couldn't get from the Bible that sexual desire isn't a wonderful gift. I tell you, if I was to read the original Hebrew translations of some of the bits of the Bible, I don't care what experiences you've had in life, you will blush. Because the freedom of sexual desire, this good thing that we have within us, is beautiful and from God. I've told you before, he was the one who designed and made sensitive parts of your body. It was his idea, not yours. But when it becomes covetous and darkened desire, 
We know that something has gone wrong. And you agree with that, even though you sometimes excuse it in yourself. Shall I tell you how you agree with it? So you know full well that if I go out for a nice romantic meal with my my missus and we go to a nice restaurant and we sit there and she's just looking at me going... (laughs) Because I'm all over the place with my eyes... And I turn to her and go, what, what? I've ordered, but it's okay to look at what's on the menu. If she was to boot me in the nuts, you'd go up and congratulate her. Because you know that it's not not right. Because what I'm doing with those looks in that moment is trying to take something that I've promised to another. How about this way? I think my daughters are beautiful. I like to tell you that my daughters are beautiful. But please be aware, fellas, that if I see you looking at my daughters with that look, and you know what I'm talking about, that lingering glance, that in that moment, I know what you're doing. I'm going to smack you silly. Because you don't get to do that with my daughter. Not just because I'm a protective father, but because I know, and you know what we're talking about is going on in your head in that moment. You are taking something that does not belong to you, and you have no rights to it, and you're using it for your amusement and your gratification. How dare you dehumanize my daughter like that? And it's strange, isn't it, that I can feel that way about my daughters and be so protective, but to my shame, am I as protective of other people's daughters? Or do I look and linger. Oh dear. Anybody feeling this? Now you've got teenagers in the room. It might surprise you that you guys haven't got the monopoly and the lockdown on sexual desire. It might be a surprise to you that people, even grown-ups, even married people struggle with this one. There is something inside of me that wants to take a desire that has been put in me by God and to take it to all kinds of covetous places to claim it and use it for myself. And it always, always, always ends up darker and brings shame. The problem is, is it's so... It hides, doesn't it? It masks. So often it masks itself as curiosity. So whether it's on a phone or in a magazine and you're like... Oh, six pack abs there and you just slow down I'm just ki- wow how did he get that that's impressive or else it's somebody's photo album from Ibiza oh I wonder what they got up to and you, pff, Ibiza hello you know what's going on there or perhaps it's just I don't know headlines clickbait it's called clickbait Because it's like a baited hook, it's going to pull you in under the guise of curiosity, and you know why you're clicking on it, don't you? Don't you? Don't leave me up here, people, I know what you do. Because the same stuff that is inside of you is inside of me. For a guy, it's easy. You know, you go to the gym, and you see this beautifully shaped lady who is doing all these kind of exercises that are just designed to put men under the test and I'd like to tell you that my thought first thought is look away but it's not it's oh I'd like to tell you that my first thought is that's not my wife but it's actually or just a little longer do we know what we're talking about here people And I indulge a desire and I start to go places and I imagine things. And I do it for all kinds of different reasons. And it was never supposed to be that way. And it seems that from a young age, these desires get a hold of us, that we will do stuff with our sexual desires. But it's it's coveting. It's trying to use people and use things and create a world of our making rather than live joyfully under this king who has come. And he looks them in the eye and he says, I'm going to break this Excuse me, I'm going to break this one. In my kingdom, you're going to have a righteousness that is deeper than merely not touching to having a heart transformed. Where does this brokenness all start? Can I tell you, it starts when you're young. Some of you are just breaking into some of these feelings. 
And there is maybe something you see for the first time. Maybe you get exposed to something. To me, it was Victoria Warren at the age 12. We got taken around to her house, and she cracked open her dad's pornographic video collection. And suddenly I'm exposed to stuff that I'm just not supposed to see. Other people get exposed because, well, it's by accident, or they just find themselves just being drawn to certain pictures or a certain person. Or other people get exposed because of, well, a, a snatched away innocence that shouldn't have happened. Maybe by somebody who is in responsibility over them and should have honored and upheld them. Something happens, and there's this strange awakening that happens, and you're not quite the same again. And because you're a human, and you've got thoughts, and you've got desires, and you've got a will, you, you cope with it, you do something with it. So you get exposed, and then you get confused, don't you? Because you, you half enjoy it, but you also know that it's darkened, and you carry a measure of shame around with you. And you're in this thing where, I really don't want this to be a part of my, but I want this to be a part of my life. So what you do is you formulate ways either to pursue it or to sort of limit it a little bit. And you'll do it by justifying it. And you learn to justify that from a young age and that grows into your life and you'll justify it in other domains of, uh, of, of, of your life. You'll, you'll, you'll be like, well, what does it matter to do a bit of window shopping? I mean, my fellow's really let himself go. Or you'll look out and you'll say, well... Um, I've just got a long time till I find somebody and I'm in this period of waiting. What am I supposed to do with these desires that seem dominating? Surely the Lord doesn't want me to feel like this. I'll just click and I'll feel like there's a bit of a release. Or else I'm like, well, do you know, I'm, my wife is great and everything, but um, she's just, I'm not really attracted to her kind. I'm attracted to this kind. Or at least we justify it, say, as if we haven't got any control over our preferences and our covenantal faithfulness. So we get exposed, we get confused, and it builds up a pattern of thought and coping within us to a point where sometimes it goes quiet for a while, but then it comes back quite strongly and we feel utterly overrun. And what happens is our mind that has almost been programmed to think like this, we've programmed it, we tend to go after these, these moments of sexual intimacy and fantasy and gratification in our heads and in our hearts. That covetousness comes out in two ways. It's usually... Either I hunger or I hurt. I hunger or I hurt. Maybe you'll recognize this. Maybe it's a time when you just hunger. You just, you just have a desire to be desired. They have this thing called a, a thirst trap where a young lady, because what she will do is she will post a suggested picture of herself online, which is a thirst trap. She's trying to catch thirsty guys because it just gives her a little a bit of a buzz to feel rather good. Men try to do it. And it don't look so good, but because there's such a strong desire there, they think it does, okay? So if you've posted pictures of yourself in a suggestive manner and you're a fella, mm, stop it. Girls stop it as well. Just stop it. But what's happening there in that moment, I just hunger to be desired. I want to be desired. Or else I want a reward. Don't you know how hard I've been working? And I'm tired and my energy levels have dropped. I just want to let my mind go. And that, that's a place of happiness and reward for me. For others, it's power. I look upon a beautiful thing and I just want the power to own it. And I want to own it on my terms. I don't want to give it permission to be itself. I, I want to own it. The ultimate expression of that is rape. I'm going to own and do it and I'm going to do it powerfully. Or sometimes I want to be overpowered. And there's all kinds of darkened expressions of sexual love, supposedly, uh, both in marriage and outside of marriage, that are all about the fact I just want to be dominated. Or else I'm just drawn, and it starts early as a, as a child. I get a bit of a kick out of the illicit. I'm hungry for the buzz. Life is hard. Don't you know what I'm facing? I want that thrill of the illicit. And in that moment when my life is feeling boring and dull, I will pull out the raft of images or ideas or feelings that are filed away. Isn't it so hard, this one? Because once you see something, you can't unsee it. That's why we know the Lord Jesus wasn't straight up being dead serious in the next bit he says about cut off your eye, cut off your eye, because he knows you can't unsee stuff. It's in there. And what we do is we go to it and we pull it off the shelf and we play around with it and we stroke it a little bit and it becomes a monster. And those are, that's when we hunger. But what about when we hurt? Maybe we're angry or upset, or disappointed, or discouraged, and I want a place of comfort that just gives me a place of rest. 
And so I'll pull in those thoughts, those darkened thoughts, and I'll go to some imaginings, and it will take me to places. Of course, the ultimate example of that, which is sort of look but don't touch, is that is the pornogra- uh, um, pornography epidemic that is there. And the sad thing is, is that it's become seemingly more acceptable to dig in, saying it's not going to hurt my relationships in the slightest. I'll come to that in a minute. And it's more available. So we carry around crack cocaine in our pockets. And it's really hard not to go there. And I'm going to talk to you in a minute about ring fencing and and making yourself safe from that if we can. But once we've been exposed and once we're excused and once we start making it a go-to place, we get convicted. And we say to ourselves, I mustn't do this. I mustn't dwell there. And then four days later, you find your heart drifting in that direction. And you find a spiritual coldness comes over you. And people, somebody like Steve stands up at the start of a church service and says, we're going to sing about the God of hope who fills us with joy and peace. And it feels a million miles away. Maybe you're carrying shame. You become spiritually darkened in your understanding, in your life. See Ephesians chapter 4. And relationally, you're distant and you have to play and hide in the dark or compartmentalize away a part of your nurtured, quiet life. I'm dealing with a a number of friends and have walked with them through uh, periods of time in the last 12 months who they have just gone to play with an idea in their hearts, thought it wouldn't catch them, but it ensnares them, draws them in, and walks them to a living hell. And they're like, how did I get here? Why does it feel so powerful? Because there is an enemy of our souls who wants to take us out, and the place where he will take us out is in our thought life. He wants us to do anything other than walk as those who are poor in spirit. He wants us to do anything other than give our lives away for others to the glory of Jesus. He says, keep your life, says Satan. He says, use other people for your, go to your special place for comfort. Be angry and act out. Demand that God gives you what you feel you need. And so Jesus comes along and he says, in a very revealing way, he says, verse 27, sorry, verse 28, but I tell you, that anyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery with her in his heart. So, singles, if you get impatient and you start searching online for images or you just want to connect up to that chat, or perhaps you just get tired of waiting and you've got these desires that seemingly are unmet and you just want to push and and connect to somebody romantically, then sexually, who doesn't know Jesus. Or married people. You think God hasn't given you enough in your life, and you lack contentment, and it's difficult at home, and so you let your heart and your mind go there. Maybe you just say, I'm just not attracted to my husband or my wife like I was. That starts in you, by the way, but we could talk about that another time. Lust can camouflage as love. It deceives you. It justifies itself. It is enslaving. Let me just talk about pornography for a second because that is the greatest example of this. Won't affect my relationships at all. Eh, Wrong. Scientifically, studies have been done and we all know it to be true that users of pornography have their heart and their brain rewired of different expectations of looks and performance. So when it comes to the real deal, they're messed up. Now, I've had to work this through in my marriage because I brought a whole stack of this into my marriage. Can you imagine me visiting that down on my poor wife? And in that moment, I'm treating her as an object to fulfill me rather than one who I'm supposed to love and give myself away for. Not only does pornography change the expectations of users, it diminishes our tolerance for real-world relationships. Because the thing about pornography is you can click on what you want, where you want, how you want, and it will cost you nothing. That's the exact opposite of any relationship in a real world. Because in a real world, she talks back at you, he talks back at you. And he's got spots in all the wrong places. And it's, 
when you have your loving, the heavens don't always open. And you can't handle it. And it leads you into discontent. Pornography means nowadays that men and women can't handle a real man and a real woman. But also on top of that, imagine the crushing pressure that a pornified culture is putting on young women. Women are forced to conform to sexual behavior and appearance that might seem alluring, but robs them of dignity and says you're only worth it if you can do that. Who are we to do that to people? And we see that this is taking root, and it's so painful. Do you see what pornography does? It's sort of like a, a look-but-don't-touch version, but it uses other people, it kills our soul, it crushes our joy, it enslaves us, it's covetousness. And the Lord Jesus looks them in the eye and says, No! I want you to walk in life and joy and peace, and I'm going to deliver you from this thing because I know what you're facing. You come under me as your king, and I'm going to take you on a journey of renewal. And it will feel long, and it will feel hard, but I am going to get you literally to the promised land. I'm with you, and I'm for you, and my grace will be sufficient. My kingdom, you're going to be remade. So if you name me as your Lord and Savior, quickly get on board and be part of the revolution, people, because the train is leaving and you've got to get on board. So what to do? Well, he talks about this with the drastic nature, doesn't he? Look at this drastic nature in these last two verses that we've got there. So if your right eye causes you to sin, gouge it out and throw it away. It is better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. And if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. It is better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to be thrown and go into hell. So what are we supposed to do? Simple, and don't do it literally. Blood will go everywhere. It'd be really hard for you to hold your Bible and read it at the same time with one eye and one arm. So don't go there, but be aware of this. Jesus says, get drastic, get real. Do you remember in that century, your right eye and your right arm symbolized the thing of most value that would affect your life and shape your life. It was your point of strength. It was the thing that you said you needed to be able to live by. So do you get that? He's immediately saying there's going to be some things that you think you cannot live without, that you're going to have to live without to get rid of this thing. It's very vivid, isn't it? Are you already thinking about it? Oh, Steve, don't tell me I can't have that. Are you already thinking of it? Of course you are. You know the things that you've told yourself you have to have and you can't live without. And Jesus says, there's going to be some things that you're just going to have to chop straight out of there. When the Apostle Paul talked about sin, he said, fight it, resist it. But when he talked about sexual sin, he said, run from it. Do you get that? Run from it. Get rid of it because it's going to fight and it'll try and pull you down. So you need to starve it, get it as far away from yourself as you can. So imagine that you guys say, right, next week, one month from now, you're going to have a fist fight to the death with Tom. But here's the thing. You get one choice. You get to choose what you're going to feed him for the next month. And that's all he gets to eat. It shouldn't take me very long to figure out that if I'm going to be going in a fist fight to the death with Tom in a month's time and I get to choose what I get to feed him, I'm going to feed him nothing. I want him as weak as possible. And even then the outcome would be in doubt. But I want him as far weakened as possible. So the Lord Jesus says, cut it out. Chop it off. Get Rid, bin off that TV series that you know titillates you. Get covenant eyes on every single device that gives a report to somebody about what you're watching, man, woman, child, get it on there. We've had it on for about eight or nine years. My wife knows what I'm watching. She's got, it's, I'm on lockdown. And you say, Steve, you're really, really weak. I say, no, I'm just really, really clever because I know what I'm facing. And I know that 360 days of the year, this isn't going to be a problem. 
But when I'm weak and when I'm tired and when I'm discontented and when I'm angry and when I've got pretensions on being special and feeling like I need to be rewarded, on those five days, I'm not feeding this thing. I'm going to put stuff around me to protect me. I'm not even going there. So you need a faithful friend, sister, brother who's going to be your accountability partner. Lock down them devices so that the stuff that will allure you, that you will feed and it will call to you when you're feeling low and feeling sorry for yourself or it's been a hard day at work, it will call to you and you'll be like, yay, I can't even go there if I try. He says, cut it out. Be careful if you're somebody who travels alone. Just be careful. For some of you guys and some people who travel for work, I need to have better conversations with you. I've asked a little bit, but I've been a bit of a coward, so I'm going to be asking you, so just prepare your excuses ahead of time. Learn to bounce your eyes off this. You know, bounce your eyes sort of there. Move them away. Okay. None of them lingering looks. Just flat out avoid certain shops at the retail park. Flip. Bare neck, you know, you're walking along with my little daughter, and I don't know whether to look at her going like this or just look at what I'm seeing because I'm like, wow! Just go different places. And let me tell you this if you struggle, can I tell you that's good? Because it means you've not been overcome. Did you hear me on that? It means you're still alive. Dead body doesn't struggle anymore. And the Lord is with you and He is for you. I want to say to you that you need to be careful about how, how, how much you are a temptation to other people as well. So I'd like to say to you, ladies, please try to dress in a way that looks attractive but isn't seductive. Do you get what I'm saying? You say, hold on, if they've got lust, that's their problem. Well, they've got a problem and Jesus is asking you to help them. Am I clear? So being modest isn't cutting you off from anything. It's helping you show your dignity. Some of you are sitting there and going, I could wear an astronaut suit and he would still lust after me. He'd be like, oh, look at them gas tanks. Oh, you can oxygenate me anytime you like, love. Yeah, I know. But please do what you can to help men or women. If you're a young lady there is an incredible draw to being desired or feeling strong because if you're desired, it can keep you safe from bad things happening. It can give you standing. It can give you the attention. Who doesn't want attention? But when you take that on, what you're doing is you're harming and hurting somebody who's made in the image of Jesus Christ. Maybe if you're in a relationship, where you're not married yet, and you keep, and uh, it's just such bad words, we say slipping, now that's called fornication, people. Slipping, then either don't be alone or end the relationship. End of. Drastic. But these are Jesus' words, not mine. If you're somebody who just can't help themselves, Peter, just pack it away for a minute, we're not finished. If you're somebody who just can't help themselves and has to watch rom-coms, and as they do, they go to this fairy tale land of romance and sexuality and think that, and it just leads you to think that if I just find the right person in the right kind of way, my life would be bliss, then don't watch those ruddy rom-coms. They're toxic for your soul. They won't help you. They won't encourage you. So what we do is, number one, we cut stuff out, we protect our souls, and number two, we, produce, uh, we pursue Jesus Christ. Did you notice that where the place of all those, these desires get fueled by and the occasion for them is when we're bored, when we feel empty, when we want to escape, when we're after a thrill, when we, feel, when we want to feel alive, when, when we just want a quick pick-me-up? Who has come? Jesus Christ has come. And our problem is not that our feelings are too weak, it's that they're focused on the wrong thing. Because, wow, how can I be bored when I've got a king who gave himself? I'm part of the, the grand narrative of a world. And Christ's king is, uh, kingdom is moving out. I'm going to let that fill my heart rather than thinking that dark and sexual desires will give me a little bit of a kick. When I feel empty and worthless and I've failed, I look to Christ as my saving king who declares over me, 
It is finished. You are mine. You are valuable. When I want escape, I run to the love of Christ. When I just want a thrill, just read almost any book in the Bible and you can see the active adventure of what is happening here. Do you see what we do? What we do is we pursue hard after Christ. And if you're feeling a failure and shamed today, then Jesus will specialise in you. Do you remember the woman caught in the act of adultery? She hadn't just thought the thoughts and let them loose. It had almost become a life-dominating habit for her. Maybe some of you are there and you know how she feels. You know what's going on with her. And they brought her out for public shaming. And they told Jesus in front of a crowd, this is what she's done. What is she going to get? And do you remember what Jesus said? Whoever is without sin, they may cast the first stone. And he bent down and he scribbled on the floor. And strangely, the crowd started to disappear. But don't miss what happened. When the crowd had slunk away in the midst of their failure with no answers to their problems, the lady came near. The Lord Jesus stood up and he said, Woman, does nobody else condemn you? Therefore, I will not condemn you. Oh, please don't hear me saying that Jesus was condoning her because he said, now leave your life of sin because I've come. Put your hope in me. Leave your life of sin. He does not condone, but because of the cross, he will not condemn. Will you come to him? Will you let him do the drastic work within you? Would you work out and live out this kingdom that shows itself in the heart a long time before it shows itself in the behavior in a way that the world around look and say, that's a light. It's a city on a hill. It's different. What's powering this kingdom? Tell me about this king so that I may find mercy and grace too. Let's stand and be amazed in the presence of Jesus as we sing.